Hello everyone and welcome back to DBX Labs. In today's video we will be making the compound amino nitroguanidine nitrate, which is a perfectly oxygen balanced secondary with a detonation velocity exceeding 9500 meters per second. This stuff detonates faster than RDX, HMX, FOX7, and even CL20 theoretically, and I'll be preparing it from just guanidine nitrate. Now up until now I really haven't focused on secondaries through this channel, mainly because testing secondaries requires larger scale testing, something that YouTube is really not fond of. Last thing I want is for this channel to get shut down because I showed a larger fireball than YouTube wanted me to show. For this reason I've mainly stuck with primaries which are very interesting in and of themselves, however this secondary is something I've wanted to tackle for a while because it's just so absurdly fast in detonation. The fact that it's perfectly oxygen balanced adds to the reasons why I want to make it, namely because there's really not a lot of high power secondaries that are perfectly oxygen balanced. RDX isn't, HMX isn't, CL20 isn't, and FOX7 isn't as well. Most secondaries you can name aren't oxygen balanced and the reason for that is really it's not that common to find. Secondary explosives like RDX, HMX, PETN, and TNT all are oxygen deficient, meaning that a few carbon atoms in their molecules go unoxidized post-detonation. This contributes to a significant amount of energy loss. Even on the other side of the spectrum, you have erythritol tetranitrate and nitroglycerin, which also lose energy due to their oxygen balances being positive. If you look through the molecule of amino nitroguanidine nitrate, you'll find that there's enough oxygen contained within the molecule to oxidize every other carbon and hydrogen atom in the molecule to a gaseous, fully oxidized state. This of course means oxidizing hydrogen all the way to water and oxidizing carbon all the way to carbon dioxide. This in turn means the amino nitroguanidine nitrate is extremely efficient in its detonation and requires absolutely zero oxygen from its environment to oxidize any of its byproducts. Now because I don't want this video to be taken down and for general safety purposes, do not try this synthesis or anything described in this video. All secondary testing done in this video is done with the smallest amounts feasible to still get accurate data and no more than that. Regardless, the testing still looks pretty cool, so I don't think I'll be disappointing anyone. Now, starting out, I've got some guanidine nitrate that we're going to have to convert into nitroguanidine for the synthesis. To do this, it's a slow dehydration of the guanidine nitrate into nitroguanidine and sulfuric acid at approximately 10 degrees Celsius or less. I was using the procedure found in all chemistry's video, and it works quite well. I've used it many, many times. Since the additions of the guanidine nitrate into the concentrated acid are quite exothermic, it takes about four hours to run this procedure to completion, after which the mostly clear solution of nitroguanidine and sulfuric acid is decanted into a lot of ice cold water. This crashes out the nitroguanidine which can then be separated. Recrystallization is necessary, so we dissolve it all into a 5 liter beaker of boiling water, and although it struggles to fully dissolve, we eventually get it to. If we compare the guanidine nitrate to the nitroguanidine in terms of heating tests, we find that they both aren't very energetic compounds. However, they do burn if heating is sustained, and the nitroguanidine burns a little bit more vigorously. Guanidine nitrate can be best described as similar to ammonium nitrate in terms of explosive properties. It's a low explosive that detonates at something like 3,000 meters per second, so somewhere in the realm of ammonium nitrate. And nitroguanidine, on the other hand, is actually a high explosive with a detonation velocity nearing 8,000 meters per second and higher if you compress it and don't allow it to form needle-like crystals. 
in the form that I have it right now, the nitroguanidine as loose bundles of crystals is nowhere near as dense as it has to be to reach these detonation velocities. If I were to guess, I'd say that this stuff compressed might be able to reach 3,000 meters per second. The next step in the synthesis of the amino nitroguanidine nitrate is to form the amino nitroguanidine itself. To do this, nitroguanidine is reacted with hydrazine hydrate at around 60 degrees Celsius and held there for about 15 minutes. The basic solution is then neutralized to a pH of 7 with hydrochloric acid and overnight upon cooling, the amino nitroguanidine precipitates out as a fine yellow powder. This reaction is stated to only yield about 50% amino nitroguanidine based off of starting nitroguanidine. However, in my best trials of the synthesis, I only reach about 40%. Looking back on the trial that I recorded for the synthesis, I recall that I added the hydrazine solution way too quickly into the solution of nitroguanidine, and that likely contributed to my yield being very low at only 20%. Nonetheless, we have a yield, although it's pretty poor and frankly a little bit disappointing. I should note that while I didn't use pure hydrazine hydrate for the synthesis, I experimented a bit trying out mixtures of free-based hydrazine in ethanol, all the way to just adding the free-based form of the hydrazine with the sodium hydroxide still in solution. I found that if I reacted a stoichiometric equivalent of hydrazine sulfate with an excess of sodium hydroxide and added this to the nitroguanidine solution, the reaction would still take place and this is actually what I used to get that 40% yield. Apparently the excessively high pH of the solution resulting from adding all that sodium hydroxide has no ill effect on the reaction and it still takes place quite well. From what I've read, the hydrogenation of nitroguanidine with hydrazine hydrates results in the formation of several byproducts. However, all of these are water soluble and none of them precipitate out overnight when we cool down the solution. When dry, the amino nitroguanidine is very prone to rapid decomposition. Any substantial external heating results in the formation of a large amount of flammable gases, which sometimes ignite just from the action of heating. This compound in and of itself is stated to have a detonation velocity exceeding 8,000 meters per second. However, it is quite oxygen deficient, unlike its nitrate salt. To form this nitrate salt, we just dissolve the amino nitroguanidine into a solution of 40% nitric acid. Upon cooling, the nitrate salt precipitates out, and while in a paper it's stated to have a 90% yield, the maximum I've been able to reach was about 65%. I haven't recovered all the product from the solution shown in this video, but from what I did recover over the first night of cooling, I only recovered 5 grams from the 7 grams of amino nitroguanidine. So the product is a fine white powder, and when we look at it under the microscope, it doesn't really look any different. It clearly looks a bit amorphous, and I don't really see any crystalline structure. One paper claims that it forms block-like crystals, but I don't really see that apparent here. Then again, this hasn't been recrystallized, so that might be the reason why. On heating from both above and below, the product releases flammable gases, which spontaneously ignite without any source of ignition. It responds quite a bit more violently to flame than the plain amino nitroguanidine did. And of course, this makes sense considering that there's three more oxygen atoms and a nitrogen along with this molecule. Now I did do shock tests on the anvil for every one of the four compounds that we addressed in this video. However, not a single one of them detonated on the blow of a hammer, so I can't really display any differences in the sensitivities of each. Just going off of the papers that I've read, they progressively get more sensitive as you go from the guanidine nitrate to the nitroguanidine to the amino nitroguanidine and then finally to the amino nitroguanidine nitrate. Now in order to test the brescence of the amino nitroguanidine nitrate, I'll be doing a side-by-side -side comparison with another secondary, which is a 4 to 1 ratio of erythritol tetranitrate and picric acid. Do note that in the testing I'll be doing here, neither of the secondaries are at their peak density. Surely the ETN is nowhere near that considering it's not even melt cast. But regardless, the 1 gram to 1 gram scale should give us an idea of how much energy is being released from each and how rapidly it's being released. 
Each of the two charges were prepared with identical BNCP bridge wire detonators, which I'll be initiating from afar simultaneously with my capacitor bank. Once again, these tests are solely being done for educational purposes, so please do not attempt to emulate anything you see in this video. Okay, so here's the bridge wire detonator or the capacitor bank ready to go. We have the firing mechanism. And here's where it will all be going down. Camera set up. On the left, we have our amino nitriguanidine nitrate. And uh, on the right, we have our four to one ratio of ETN to picric acid. They're hooked up in parallel and that's just going to connect uh, to our uh, wiring that leads back to the capacitor bank. And yep, they're both one gram. So we'll see what kind of uh, explosive force we get from that amino nitroguanidine nitrate in comparison to the control. So the results are very contradictory to what I would have imagined would be the results of this test. Clearly, the amino nitroguanidine produced a smaller hole in the pi pan than the ETN slash TNP. While I could lump this up to just being a result of not compressing the samples enough, I also can theorize what might be going on here. My thinking goes like this. Newtonian physics say that kinetic energy is equivalent to work, which is equivalent to force times the distance applied. I'm thinking that the explosive kinetic energy has some correlation to the product of the pressure produced by an explosion, otherwise known as the overpressure, times the distance that that overpressure is impacting a surrounding material. Now, obviously, there are many more variables that come into play when measuring the total explosive kinetic energy. However, what I'm saying is I think that there's an inversive relationship between pressure produced and distance in which that pressure is inflicted. I say this because amino nitroguanidine nitrate and ETN both have relatively similar explosive energies per gram. However, because amino nitroguanidine is more brisant, it has a greater overpressure and therefore that energy has to be expended in a smaller radius in order to satisfy this equation. This would also mean that in this radius, the pressure would be much, much higher than in this radius. As a result, we would expect to see much smaller shrapnel coming off of this than that. The more brissant explosive would do a better job of shattering the testing material than the less brissant explosive. However, when we look at the piece of wood that was situated behind the pie pan during the detonation, I don't really see anything conclusive here. There's certainly a lot of holes, and while the ETN was stationed here and the amino nitroguanidine nitrate here, this alone doesn't really tell us that much. For this reason, I'm going to do one more test with a compacted amount of amino nitroguanidine nitrate. I remotely compressed this sample, and it has a density of about 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter. If anything is going to have a super high detonation velocity, it should be this and I'm going to set up another pie pan to do another test. And if the hole is smaller or stays the same, we know that this is in some part true. If it's bigger, then, well, this was just a shit test.
Okay, so clearly this new test of the amino nitroglyndine outperformed any of the previous tests. We can see that the hole produced is bigger than the ETN hole produced in the first test and much, much bigger than the hole produced by the amino nitroglyndine in the first test. If it's not clear enough, just from what you're seeing, I can assure you this is at least 1.5 times larger in area than that, and that's at least 1.5 times larger in area than that. Now, I don't want to entirely trash this equation that I was working with before, but we do know now that a compressed amount of amino nitroguanine nitrate certainly outperforms the ETN. Now before we finish the video off, here's a short clip of some amino nitroguanine nitrate detonating. I recorded this about two months ago before I even planned to do a video on this compound, but it's a pretty cool test. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.